you'll always find you know, most of the conflict in some form or the other is related to the land. And if you look at them seriously, the argument is whose land it is. My land and your land. That's number one. Number two, if you look at the Hindi films, most of the old time films will be, your grandfather had a problem with my grandfather, and therefore you and I should bear in this. Okay? That's exactly what it is. And the same thing is happening in the Israeli Palestinian country. Whose land it is, or who came first. We all know that monkey came first, that means theory. But no, nobody <coughs> wants to accept that. So we have to say, okay, whether you came first or I came first. So if you look at it, the centrality of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is about the land. But if you talk about the land, it's, that is where the whole issue begins. And if you're familiar with uh, religion, and most problems, the moment you get into the religious argument, it's impossible to, to resolve, almost. Because religions believe in what you know as the sense of supremacy. My religion is supreme to everyone here. If you look at all the religions have a word for the other. Us and them. Every religion has it. Hinduism talks about millage. Judaism talks about Gentile. Christianity talks about infidel and pagan. Islam talks about kafir. So if you look at it, all of them talk about the other. I am the greatest guy, you are not. Okay? It is universal. That's one of the things common with all the religions. So if you have a land which also has a religious dimension, it's almost impossible to resolve. Because the moment you accept every religion is equal, the sense of supremacy goes. It's like your caste system. The moment you agree a Brahmin is equal to Dalit, then why do you need a caste system? The same argument. The moment I say my religion is equal to yours, then how am I superior to you? No matter what religion you follow. So here, the religion is combined with the land. That is what the problem is. OK. For us, if this is not enough, there is another dimension called time. Someone was living in a territory called X, and he goes out, and still he keeps an emotional attachment to the land, even though he no longer lives. Anyone from Punjab? OK. Where do you celebrate by shopping? Specifically. <coughs> yeah, give me the, well, you don't remember. Oh. 14th January, by Sanke. Hey guys, this, is, this must be 13th Okay, 13th April, fine. What is the significance of this land, 13th April? You say by Sanke, right? What is the symbolism of that? Why do you celebrate this? Or the season? Are you sure? OK, let's say you go to Oslo. Suddenly you get a scholarship, you teach in Oslo. Then you celebrate by Saki. Let's say that you are culturally you want to communicate the same thing. You spend your time in Oslo. You stay there, part of the Norwegian citizen. You are there. When do you celebrate by Saki? Same day? Are you sure? If you open the window, there will be snow there. Are you going to harvest the snow? So the harvest season in Norway probably comes in September. Then how do you celebrate on 14th of, 13th of April by Sankey? Is there any logic there? If she celebrates in April, in Oslo, by Sankey, the harvest festival, where outside is the snow, is there a logic? No logic. Is there a logic? Guys? No. It's the, it's no. The, uh, basically, the harvest period in the area I come from. But you live in Oslo today. Yes, but I come from somewhere else. There is some sort of emotion involved, right? Exactly. That's where it is. If you are someone from Punjab, no matter that, even if you live in Mars, my start is 13th of April. That is what it is. So the people who left that land, no matter where they live, they always had an emotional link to the particular land and commemorated everything in relation to where you come from, not where you live. 
the same thing. Baisakhi is April 13th, no matter what is there outside your window. That's the day of August. Even if you live in North Pole, April Shankaranti is a 14th if you are Madras. By the way, I'm, so I can use the word, don't worry. <laughs> Otherwise, it will be racist in the way. <laughs> so that is what it is. So the people who left from the land, they carry the emotional linkage. Yes. Uh, so you gave three dimensions as to what the conflict is coming, coming from. Can I give you, uh, can I pose a question to you? If I say that, no, this comes from a very deep-seated urgent movement about this ego thing, and this religion is basically a manifestation of this ego. So are you telling me that this problem will always and continuously <coughs> that uh, there is no solution, the cyclic argument, like Derrida's survey? Are you making this argument that as an epistemology this will always go on and by the uh, argument of religion it will always be a continuous loop and there is no end to this argument? See, the moment you bring in religion in the picture, it's impossible to resolve. Unless you're willing to recognize there is a religious dimension to it. I want the conflict to continue. Otherwise, I want it to jump. Okay? I like to become a good team. Okay? Let's be very honest. So I'm a very realistic guy. I don't know anything other than to teach the conflict. That's the only thing I know. That's the only thing I can do a good job. Okay? That's a very realistic, down to earth answer. More serious words. So the problem is you are removed from the land, but you carry your emotions. Therefore, you have what is known as diaspora. This word is one of the most misused terms today. I'm from Chennai. Can you call me a Tamil diaspora in Delhi? No way. No way. The diaspora presupposes two things. One, there should be a homeland from that. You are removed forcefully. <coughs> I'm an economic migrant. In Chennai, I can only talk about Dravidian politics. There is no way whether DMK is good, MDR, ADMK is good, or Amar, Aya, whatever the case may be. <laughs> Nobody is interested in talking about Israel or international relations. So I'm an economic migrant thinking, OK, Jain is a better place to teach. So you cannot call me a diaspora. You need a homeland, emotionally linked, and from that, you are removed by force. <coughs> Therefore, you carry an emotional longing. Someday, someplace, I will return. This is like Manmohan Desai film. Three generations later, someday I'll go back to my village. That is what keeps people alive. So the people who are forced out, they someday wanted to go back. The only problem was, it is a pretty long time frame. We are talking about nearly two millennia. That is what the difficulty is. If you're removed from a place for 10 years ago, I want to go back to my own home, it's easier. Here we are talking about a group of people who are driven out of the house in 70 AD, 70 years after Christ, and they were in the state of diaspora till 1948. That is why the land dimension becomes central. You simply, it's like any other dispute. By the way, if you look at this, uh, the city of Jerusalem, most of the territory is owned by the churches. They're the largest uh, land owning class when it comes to the city of Jerusalem. So the logic was, I eventually want to go back to my territory. There were 2,000 years gap. That's number one. The second thing was, during my absence, from my homeland, somebody else was already living there. That is what the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is about. Two sets of people fighting for the same piece of territory, claiming it to be their own. That's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for me. The one question is, we'll come to that. The one was, it is from 70 AD to 1948. There is a huge time break. The second thing was, when these people decided to go back, it was not an empty land. If you have to talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, in one sentence, it is two nations fighting over a same piece of territory. Yes, sir. So, I, okay, now, not in a hypothetical situation, my hometown, 
just 200 years back, it was owned by someone else. We bought the property from someone else. So are you saying that the very conflict of Israel is something which comes from a fight of dispute of land? However, I tell you that this situation exists everywhere. Population, people live in places, people move from places. So are you saying that my inherent right to a place will always remain on that? Because probably I'm an Aryan, so my genesis lies someplace, somewhere in Afghanistan. So should I go and bark up a tree there and say, no, this is my inherent or my property? Uh, that's your freedom to bark at a tree. That's your choice. I won't question it. What I'm saying is this. If you say that you are forcibly removed from that place, you never left your emotional attachment to that territory, and you always say, wherever I live is only a temporary place for me as well as for the other person. I don't feel a full citizen in the land I live, and the peop other people who are living in that don't consider me as a full citizen. In other words, I'm only a temporary transit passenger in that particular territory. Therefore, I need to go back. This is the only place I can call my home, then you are right. So my emotion explodes as an implosion only if I'm forcefully threatened out of my place, or does it happen even if I'm not threatened out of my place? It doesn't happen if you don't threaten. It presupposes you have a home, from there you are forcibly removed, yeah. and you continue to keep on thinking that I will go back to that place because where I live is not my home. Or the people who are in that land don't consider me as free. That is the precondition. If you can think of any other group, the same logic applies. A native land, from where you are forcibly expelled, and you are able to maintain the link because you are not a fully integral, integrated into the land you live. I can see that, that is what it is. I can see that fact. However, the fact is that the uh, Israel-Palestine situation is something which has reached such a critical stage. My simple submission would be, to how long have you been around if that's, you can stand there, I will sit here. I no problem. So the question is, let's first understand it, then we get into arguments. Because that's a precondition. Because I don't want to be simply a dialogue and so that all the other people will say, hey, let's go home. Okay? That's a problem when you are looking. Questions are valid, but let's not make it into bilateral arguments. Please? Okay. Anything else? Yes, lady. Okay. Anything? You know about it. Intensified is much longer. Okay, let's talk about religion. Okay? Because we said about Jerusalem and religion. Um, is Jerusalem important to Islam? How? Please, please, please. Important mask? Mosque is a place of worship. Okay. I thought it's an assembly. It's a place you assemble for prayer. That is what is important. There are so many. Do you believe that the Prophet Muhammad uh, did a night journey on a winged horse and went to Jerusalem where he met Moses, etc., ascended to heaven? Uh, and there was a rock from which he ascended to heaven, so it's the dome of the rock. Exactly. If you look at in Islam, it says there are two sets of verses. That is, one verse is at Mecca and Medina, the one after Jerusalem. According to Islamic tradition, Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven from the rock in Jerusalem. He was accompanied by an angel called Gabriel. So therefore, for Muslims, Jerusalem is the third holiest place after Mecca and Medina. So you have Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem. For the Christians, yes sir. Birth of the crime. Mm, okay, six o'clock. Don't worry about that. Yes, sir. Yourself. Uh, you know, you should have elementary knowledge on religion, right? I'm not trying to convert everybody into a religious uh, fanatic. At least some basic knowledge on religion, right? Yes, sir. You're avoiding me. So, I know, I know. Why is it important to Christians? 
Exactly. The centrality of Christianity is the resurrection, not the crucifixion. There are so many people who are crucified, and uh, before Christ, after Christ, and every time. The centrality of Christianity was resurrection, not dying on the cross, resurrecting after crucifixion. And that took place in Jerusalem. So if you are a Christian, the most important place will be Bethlehem, where Jesus Christ was supposed to have been born, and Jerusalem from where he is supposed to have been resurrected. Guys, it's basically your faith. You believe or not, that's a different story. So for me, you know, from Krishna to Christ to everybody is uh, supposed to have been done. Okay? <laughs> that is what it is. Then only you can be a good student. If I say, no, 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 Christ did this, no, then we are getting into trouble. Everything is supposed to have been there. So therefore, you can understand the faith. I'm not asking you to be a believer, but understand the belief. Then you understand the complexity of the problem. Okay. For, yes, sir. Between what I, I said rebirth and you said it's resurrection. Reason, rebirth, you know, the second coming is also the expression. Okay, the question so is resurrection. That's a key word. Okay. Any other thing you said is not correct. Key word, if it's objective type question, key word is resurrection. Anything else is not considered correct. Okay, for the Jews. Yes, sir. <laughs> good, 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 good. good. Uh, every Jew prays that someday they return to Jerusalem. That's, that's all I want. No, oh God, no, no, no. You're all reading it. No, I'm not asking all the laptops. You're just checking, downloading materials and finding it out. No way I'm not accepting. Yes, sir. Anyone? If you look at the Jewish uh, thing, there is something called first temple and the second temple. And the argument was God actually resided there. That's what is called temple. So the first and the second temple were almost built on the same place. And the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Therefore, if you are a Jewish person, the centrality of your life was Jerusalem. If you are a Christian, the most important place was Bethlehem. The second important was Jerusalem. And if you are a Muslim, Mecca, Medina, and then Jerusalem. This is what's important of all the three religions. I'm coming back to the question of land. If I ask you to imagine yourself, suppose, let's say, this is the place which is known as Al-Aqsa Mosque. That is the place where Omar prayed, which is not, that is not the Dome of Rock. And from there, no, this is not a, okay, we'll put this, this is a better place. Okay, this is a Al-Aqsa Mosque. And the Holy Sepulchre, where Christ is supposed to have resurrected, is there somewhere in this place. Okay? And the Western Wall, which is the only remaining portions of the Second Temple, is this one. And if you look, look at it, this is probably the Alexa mosque is on the second floor. And this is the Western Wall. And that is the Holy Sepulchre, where Christ is crucified. <coughs> and the distance between these two, as the crow flies, is 300 feet. That's what it is. How do you divide it? You can actually say, okay, 300 feet is good enough, okay, Alexa is the... The Holy Sepulchre is there here. We can actually put up a barrier. How do you divide the Western Wall and the Alexa Mosque? This is not like your Ayodhya, right? <laughs> because in Ayodhya, you, you just only politics. If you go into Indian theology, nowhere you will find a place becomes holy simply because X, Y, Z was born there. Nowhere it says. That is why if you are a true Hindu, you are cremated after death. You come from nowhere, you go nowhere. No place is sacrosanct. But our guys went into politics. But if you look at the Western Wall and the Jewish question, it is a reality. How do you divide it? This guy says, this is Alexa Mosque, the third holiest place. And the other guy says, this is the Western Wall, that is the holiest place for me. How do you divide <laughs> it? Because this one is on the second floor. Suppose this is Alexa Mosque, the wall after this building is the Western Wall. How do you divide it? 
And that is what the land question is central to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And when I said that it's simply not a question of four acres, five acres land, this land has an emotion. You have an enormous emotional question. So the moment you get into religion, it is history, geography, theology, archaeology, and emotions. We need to understand that this is the problem. Otherwise, we say Israeli-Palestinian conflict is very simple. Let's have a state and let's solve it. No way. If it is so simple, you don't need me to explain it. You are living in Ariana, right? What's the capital? Chandigarh. What's the capital of Punjab? How come? How come? Both can be capital of the two states of India? Hmm? Suppose, let's say, Modi says, I'm going to fund a new city. If I'm going to fund a new capital for Andhra Pradesh, let me fund a new city in called Indra Prasar, maybe Watchpai Nagar or something. What will be the capital of Haryana? Exactly. What will be the capital of Punjab? Chandigarh. Both will say, I don't want this. Give me the new city. Okay? That's where the money is, right? Punjab will say, no, Haryana can take Chandigarh. I want the new city. Ariana will say the same thing. No, no, you take Chandigarh very generously. I take the new city. <laughs> In other words, the problem of Punjab and Ariana can be resolved by building a new city. It's not a West Berlin, East Berlin type. If this is a small piece of territory, which is claimed by all the three monotheistic religions, how do you divide it? How do you say it belongs to X, it belongs to Y? How do you do that? It is almost impossible. Because if you look at today, everyone is saying, this belongs to me. The other guy says the same thing. How do you divide it? The funny part of it, all the three people come from the same Abraham. One call it Abraham with a V. The other calls it Abraham with a V. The third one calls it Ibrahim. The same person. You have a same monotheistic origin. You fight for the same piece of territory. And everyone wants exclusive sovereignty. The Palestinians is not saying, okay, give me a Palestinian state, let Israel take Jerusalem. They are not saying it. Israel is not saying, give me peace, you take Jerusalem. They are not saying it. The only people who actually left out in this drama is the Christians. You know, Christians, they are busy with other things, from Vatican to everything else. If you look at it, gradually, Okay, we are enough of the religion and politics playing for centuries of the European life, so we don't want one more Jerusalem coming into the picture. Except for occasional statements from the Vatican, Christian countries do not make that into an issue. It's basically between a Jewish people and the Muslim population. That is what it is, largely. So when you say land, it is not just four acres of land in next to gender. This land has strong emotional things. The moment you recognize that, all the other things will fall in its place. Whether it's a question of borders, refugees, water, all the other things will come into the picture. What is the capital of Chile? Santiago. Santiago. Norway? Oslo. Oslo. Egypt? Santiago. Israel? Are you sure? <laughs> exactly. That is what it is. If you are very sure about everything, the moment you say, what is the capital of Jerusalem, everybody is saying everything. Somebody said Jerusalem, somebody said Tel Aviv. One country cannot have two capitals, right? <laughs> Capital city. Okay. <laughs> How do you explain that? So it's, I think it's the government's prerogative to decide where they want to work from. So if the Israeli government functions from Jerusalem, then... You know, most governments don't work, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're the prime minister of India and you're going to Israel and you want to meet the Israeli establishment, you go to Jerusalem. You may not want to uh, See, your embassy there, but you have to go to Jerusalem to talk to the Israeli minister. That's not the logic. So they decide where the capital is. It's not uh, what they decide. That is what I'm saying. If you're asked an objective choice question, it's very simple. Tel Aviv is the capital of Israel. The moment if you really wanted to know the reality, 
it is always, when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you'll always say, yes, but, no, but. There is no definite answer in any of the things you're going to say. You always have a clarification. The capital city basically means that is where all the institutions of the state should exist. Parliament, House of the President, Supreme Court, government. If you look at that as a criteria, everything is located in Jerusalem. But if you talk about international recognition, no one recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, including the United States. So the international community recognizes Tel Aviv as the capital, but there is nothing there in Tel Aviv except a beautiful beach. <laughs> That's all you got. So if you look at it, this is what the question is. Even an Arab ambassador, when he wants to present the credentials, he has to come to Jerusalem to present it, not in Tel Aviv. Indian Embassy is located in Tel Aviv, but presentation of credentials takes place in Jerusalem. And that is what it is. So even a small issue like capital, you don't have anything definite. The Palestinians say East Jerusalem is our capital. But today, the capital is located in Ramallah. Guys, you believe it or not, if you go to Hebrew University, in one of the rooms, you can actually see Ramallah just normally. It's about two kilometers from the Hebrew University. And one thing, if you go to Israel or Palestine, they will give you one simple advice. Never, ever stretch your hand. Because you will be in somebody's territory. <laughs> That's what it is. You know, for India, you know, we don't understand the complexity of a small state. Should there be a war between India and Pakistan, you can say, okay, I'm going to shift my capital to all the way to Bangalore. Okay, if Atma is people, it's very good for him, at least until recently. But which basically means you can exist as a small entity, minuscule India is possible. But if you look at the Israeli-Palestinian case, this is what you are talking about. The distance between the Mediterranean and the West Bank is 11 kilometers. I was actually checking the time, the distance between from my hostel to, to Jindal, it is 68 kilometers. Six times the distance. And that is what you are talking about. So when you talk about land, it's not as simple as it. We know about East and West Pakistan, right? At up to a point of time, we had a long territory called India. Okay? So therefore, eventually the inevitable happened. It is impossible. It's like a long distance marriages. Okay? You can't survive beyond a point. Up to a point, yes. Especially when you are in the early stages. Once in, in my case, you know, we were there for centuries, so it's not a problem. We'll come to that, we'll come to that. Okay, so you need a land, you need people, you need an enemy from whom you want liberation. The last question would be, to actually carry it forward, you need an ideology, otherwise you can't do it. If you look at it, and apply this to Zionism, you will get into a lot of trouble. If you talk about, you want to liberate the land, which land you want to liberate? In normal circumstances, you want to liberate the territory where you live, which was under foreign occupation. When you're talking about India wants to be liberated, you want to talk about that particular territory, whether it's the French and Italian, Chad and Nigeria, you name any country. But here, the Jews wanted to liberate the territory where they do not live. That is what is uh, something unusual. In all the other cases, the moment you say I want liberation, it basically means the land you live, I want it to be free from foreigners. But in the Zionist case, you don't want to liberate the territory where you live, but where you want to live. That is the difference. So a Jew in Europe wants liberation. He doesn't want the liberation from the French under whose control he lives. But he says, my home is Palestine. He doesn't live. So he wants to liberate Palestine so that he can go and live. This never happens in any other national liberation movements. From East, West, Africa, Latin America, you take anything you want. In all the cases, people wanted to liberate themselves 
from the territory they live or they are living. But in the case of Zionism, they want to liberate their territory where their ancestors lived so that tomorrow they could go and live. Zionism in that case is completely different from anything the human history has ever known. Number one. When you're talking about people, you say people, India wants to liberate. Means Indians who are living in the territory called India wanted liberation. This applies to every place you can think of. The French colonialism, Italian colonialism, German, anything you want. In all the cases, people were living in the territory and they wanted to liberate from the territory. In other words, the land and the people were one and the same. It's not two different things. In the Zionist case, people do not live in the territory they live, number one, Brim, and the people were not living in one place. They were scattered all over the world. So, not only in the territory is not where you live, the people are also different. So, you want, that's a land, Palestine is your homeland, you want to liberate, but as a people, you are living outside. In all the cases, the land and the people are one and the same. The moment you talk about Indonesian liberation, you are talking about a territory called Indonesia, and you are talking about the people who are living on the land called Indonesia. This is true for everyone. But in Zionism, you want to liberate Palestine, where you do not live today, and you are scattered all over the world. So, to have a liberation, you need land and the people to be one and the same. The easiest option will be your Hanuman. Hanuman can bring the land to the people. Unfortunately, people are scattered. And which land you can take? It's like a pizza delivery. Okay, I'm going to deliver every place. You can't. So, since you cannot take the land to the people, you began people to the land. That is the centrality of Zionism. So, because Palestine cannot be taken to Jews in the diaspora, you decided to bring Jews to Palestine. And that process is called Aliyah, immigration. And that was what it is. The most interesting thing about Aliyah was, you know, when you decided to come to Jindal, where are you from? Oh, Guruna Olga. This is the last place I should ask. <laughs> huh? My sir, okay. So, you know, when he leaves Mysore, he knows that, you know, I'm going to Jindal Sonipat because something is waiting for me. So, he has a control at the exit, he has a control at the entry point. If you look at Zionism, people who decided to come to Palestine, they have no idea what you are going to do in Palestine. And Palestine was not under the Jewish control, and the places where you live, you're also not under their control, but since you have an enormous driving force, if you put it very crudely, unless you are absolutely crazy, you will not do immigration. It's not that, okay, I'm coming to Sony for, for my soul, let me look for a jindal or anything else. You don't do that. You're very clear what you're going to do when you leave my soul. The clarity is there. But when you decided to do the migration, you have no idea. All you knew is, the place where I live is impossible to live. Maybe I will have a home. The only difference is, in all the cases, you have a home, you are actually going to your home. In case of Zionism, you are going to make a home. That is what the difference in Zionism from all the other national liberation movements. Home is not something which exists. Home is something you are going to create by you being there. That is what it is. And for that, you need a strong ideology. Unless you have an ideological commitment of something creating it, you will not be able to do it. With all the problems, because when you look at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we tend to look at the consequences of this process. Okay, what happened to the other when you decided to move? Fair enough. You need to look at the consequences. But before you come to the consequences, Look at the process. What made a group of people suddenly leave from wherever they are living and go to the God-forsaken place? 
And unless you have a driving force, you won't be able to do it. That is what Zionism is all about. But what we normally do is, what is the consequences of your arrival? Your arrival, if you look at it, the whole question of Israel was, by creating a state in 1948, you, end, you ended a process of statelessness like a nomadic tribe for two million years. That's the reality. You need to accept it. But in the process, you create a new problem. But guys, remember, even God did not create everybody in a fair manner, right? The classic example is you have a fair and lovely advertisement. Okay? <laughs> if you look at it, in all the advertisement, the person looks like me <laughs> in the beginning. After three weeks, like her. Why can't you do the other way around? <laughs> okay, you start with that. After three weeks of using, you become like Kumar Sami. Why can't you do that? The, the, even Almighty God has not created fairly, right? Even though Indians don't have fair, we always have the fair and lovely is more uh, uh, largest market is in India, right? Nobody else in the world. So everybody wants to be, I'm also trying to paint myself, but it doesn't work. <laughs> So that is what it is. So if you look at it, even a successful process will have its consequences. So what you're looking at is, when you look at the justice, injustice, and everything, yes, fair enough. But before we get there, let's look at the process. And with all due respect, if you can think of the most successful non-governmental organization ever created in the world, since God said, let there be light, from that time till today, that is Zionism. The most successful NGO. Because they did not control the exit point, they did not control the entry point, still you created a state in a matter of 50 years. But all the other things are the consequences. Anything else you know? You can take the road. Settlers, okay, good. Guys, ladies, don't say that I don't know. I also don't know anything. I'm studying this subject since June 1982. <laughs> okay? 1982, yes. I'm 54 years old. More than half my life. Yes. <laughs> you, when he opens the mouth, I'm scared. <laughs> You know, if you look at Zionism, they want to, you have no idea what it was all about. If you look at the one basic difference, we all face discrimination at some point of time in our life. There is not a single community in the world which has not suffered historically. Everywhere, you can think of hundreds of communities, hundreds of group of people who were suffered were suffering simply because what they are. It's like saying, you know, he's bad is one thing. You are bad because you are from my soul. That's what it's all about. It's simply generalizing, stereotyping. So if you look at it, every community in the world suffered at different points of time. The only difference from the Jewish suffering from the others is what I would call time and space dimension. In all the other cases, the suffering was confined to a specific space or specific time. A particular ruler was bad, a particular territory was bad. All your caste system exists only, at least to the best of my knowledge, only in the great Indian state. The moment you leave, nobody bothers about the caste system. All the discrimination you face, it is inbuilt to this land. So similarly, all the atrocities, whether you are talking about a minority, you are talking about an ethnic group or anything, they were confined to a specific territory and space. And Jewish life did not have that benefit. No matter where you went, no matter under what ruler you lived, you always had to suffer. And it is from that context you need to liberate yourself. All the ideology comes much later. We are talking about an historical process. 
And that is what essential to look at it. Rights and wrongs, you know, it's very easy. Whether you are right. But it is a process. And if you look at it, after going through all the process, they said, the only way I can put an end to this process is to have a state of my own. If you look at all the self-determination movements, why can't we simply say, if you look at your grandfather, they will say, the British are much better than the Indian leaders, right? How many times do you hear it from your great-grandfather? Can we go back to the British court? Guys, come and take over. They will not. That's a different story. They are insane. So it is not a question of, you know, no matter how you suffer, you wanted to move forward. So the, if you're talking about a Jewish life, they wanted to get rid of the situation. That is why you are at stake. And what we are looking at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is, it's the two sides of the same coin. What was this like a day and night? What was good for one ended up in creating problems for the other. And that is what the whole, there is no clean answer, no plus and minus, it's not there. My friend, you're, going, you're disturbing the class, I think. Leave it alone. Okay, if you're talking about settlements, settlements, you know, there is a different definition of settlement. What we understand internationally is after the June War, Israel occupied the territory called West Bank and the Gaza Strip. So the, the housing units which were created in the West Bank and Gaza Strip are known as a settlement. But you know, if you look at settlement, there's an interesting argument. Suppose if you say, I'm not satisfied India being a small state. Uh, anyone from Bengal? Okay, good. You know, I said West Bengal is too small. Let me take over East Bengal also and integrate East Bengal into India for the sake of argument. Um, you know, I think you know, we should have more people of Bengali origin in India. We don't have any sufficient reason. Whatever is the case. We are getting into problem with the Ganges River. Why get into all the trouble, Farak and all of them? Let's take over the country. There is no problem in taking over if you can actually physically do it. What you normally do is when you take over a territory, you take territory and the population. You see the tension. That is what normally you do. But if you look at the West Bank and Ghana, you have a very strange point. At one level in three days, it is a historical land of Eritrean. Okay, take it. No, 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 I can't take it. Why? If I take the territory, I have to give citizenship to the residents of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Okay? This is like, can I take Bangladesh without the Bengali? That is what the argument is. So I want the West Bank, but I don't want the people of the West Bank. Why you don't want the people of the West Bank? The moment the West Bank is integrated into Israel, you have to give full citizenship. The moment they give citizenship, Israel will not be a Jewish state. Israel will be a binational state. So, since 1967, Israel did two things. One, it never ever annexed West Bank. That is, it never said West Bank is legally part of Israel. Fine. But that did not prevent Israel from establishing Jewish households in the occupied territory. And that is what a legal dilemma. I don't want, but I still don't mind putting up something in my place. And therefore, you know, there are enormous concessions to people if you are willing to move to West Bank and Gaza. But still, the number is not large. But what we know is this. The moment Israel decided to say, this is my boundary, and if the settlement is here, there are two choices. Either you become full citizens of the Palestinian state. Just like Israel can have Arabs as citizens, the Palestinian state can also have Jews as a full citizens. Like Hindus in Pakistan, Muslims in India, and everybody else. Alternatively, I don't want to live in a Palestinian state, means you go back to Israel proper. These are the two options available. But this will not happen unless you decide this line, the border. You know, if you look at in all the countries, the moment you say border, it's very clear. 
Okay, India is an exception. Okay, you know that we don't have a border dispute with Russia. You know why? Why? No idea. Why? Exactly. We have problem with everyone with whom we share border. Only Russia is exception because we don't share a border. That's what it is. Okay, so we are not a good example. Okay, from Bangladesh to Bhutan to everyone, we have a problem. So okay, don't talk about India as an example. But if you look at all the other countries, I'm sorry, my friend, if I exceeded. Okay, you know the, the not the time, but the argument. Time is stuff. Okay, anytime. On the election. Okay. So if you look at in all the countries, the moment you say border, you have a very definitive understanding. Or if you're an imperial power, you say front line, you know, buffer zone or all the other things. But otherwise, you know, when you say India, you know, even if you don't accept the Bangla, the Pakistani and Chinese position, you know at least legally it begins from here, ends here, east to west, north south. Every country knows at least. It defines the territorial limits. Our guys are exceptional. Okay? If you talk to Israel, you will never use the word border. The border word will always come with a prefix. They will say 1923 border, which is a mandate territory. Then they will say 1947, the UNSCO border. 1948 Armistice Line, Green Line, June Line, Security Border, Defensible Border, Recognized Border. There is never a single word border. Never. That is simply because you can say that is nothing to do with Arabs not recognizing the Israeli territory. No. More than 100 years later, Zionism did not explain where I begin, where I end. The recognition of others comes secondary. The Israel is yet to define its own boundaries. If you look at the Israel's central problem, is that is the one. The real problem, you know, with all of us is not with your neighbor. You think that he's your first enemy? You think he's your enemy? No. Our worst enemy is ourselves. All you have to do is mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's my enemy? We'll find it. In all the countries, the problem is internal. But Israel says, okay, my problem is with the Palestinian. Everything, no. The real problem for Israel is internal Israeli problem. The same applies to Palestinians also. But for us in the Israeli Palestinian case, one thing which we are not able to define is the border. So the moment Israel and the Palestinians decide that will be the border, settlements will be simple. Either settlement stayed as territory of a Palestinian state, or it goes back to Israel as a full settlement. The only way for all of them, even if it means me losing a job, is coexistence. There is no other way. There is no way out. In spite of all the <coughs> tension in terms of religion, in terms of land, in terms of all the problems, coexistence is the only way out. There is no other way. You can keep on fighting. You can give jobs to Kumar Sami and the entire generation of people. Eventually, you need to resolve it by political means. In military means, I will say, my solution is your complete annihilation. Theoretically possible. Complete destruction of you is my goal. But the moment you get into the political realm, you don't say that. It's not feasible. OK, these are my core interests. This is like a BJP PDP alliance in Kashmir. Complete annihilation before the election, 44 seats. Once you know that you don't have, okay, these are my red lines. Okay, you can also, red line also can change. It becomes, you know, shades of red. But you actually prioritize your interests. So the moment you recognize there is a political solution, you need to say, okay, Palestinian state or Palestinian political rights have to be recognized, whether you like it or not. Remember, guys, you don't make peace with your friends. You make peace with your enemies. <laughs>